The Tom Woods Show, bonus episode 598. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hello and welcome to another bonus episode of the show. Remember these bonus episodes are a little bit off the beaten path, but I throw them in there in addition to the regular Monday through Friday episodes. Well, this one is for those of you who haven't yet heard an episode of my new podcast with Bob Murphy that releases a new episode every week, Contra Krugman. So if you don't go to Contra Krugman, Contra Krugman comes to you. I want to share with you an episode of that podcast. And I felt like if I did that for one of my regular Tom Woods show episodes, you'd think that I was just being lazy, trying to fill in an episode. So I'm doing it as a bonus episode. If you haven't yet subscribed to Contra Krugman or listened to an episode, I hope you'll listen to this bonus episode of the Tom Woods show, which is episode 19 of Contra Krugman. It's one of our favorite episodes. It runs a little long, but I don't think you're going to be counting the minutes. At least I I hope you won't, because we certainly enjoyed this conversation. When it's all over, I'm not going to come back on and say, well, I hope you enjoyed that. When this ends, when the Contra Krugman episode ends that I'm about to play for you, then the whole episode will be over. So ContraKrugman.com is the website for our new podcast. I do hope you'll check that out. And You can subscribe there for free, the way you do to this show. And the show notes page will be ContraKrugman.com slash 19. I guess I'll have a show notes page for this for the sake of completeness, TomWoods.com slash 598, but it'll just be directing you over to the Contra Krugman show notes page. Of course, don't forget, we're having that cruise based on the podcast. We're going to have a lot of fun on the Contra Cruise, October 9th through 16th, 2016. I hope you can join us. Find out details about that at ContraCruise.com. So what you're about to hear is a full episode of Contra Krugman. The only thing I've taken out is a little of our opening banter involving an event that's already occurred. We were talking about how we could get you free tickets into a Mises Institute event in late January, but since that's already occurred, I just uh, snipped it out. So you'll notice there's a little audio snip at the very beginning, but otherwise the episode is running as is. I really hope you enjoy it and that you check us out at ContraKrugman.com. Here we go. Contra Krugman, episode 19. Welcome to the podcast that takes apart Paul Krugman's New York Times column. Join us as Tom Woods and Bob Murphy teach economics by uncovering and dissecting the arrows of Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, newspaper columnist, and destroyer of nations. It's time for Contra Krugman. Hey, everybody. Great news. Your favorite economist, Bob Murphy, has just released his first economics course over at libertyclassroom.com. Check it out. You will become invincible. Invincibility is one of the features of libertyclassroom.com. Learn the history and economics they didn't teach you and join thousands of liberty lovers at libertyclassroom.com. Did you know Bob Murphy has his own financial publication? It's the Lara Murphy Report, co-authored with colleague Carlos Lara. Check it out at ContraKrugman.com slash LMR. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Contra Krugman. I'm Tom Woods with Bob Murphy. We're talking today about uh, we, we decided to do the Friday column. I, I, I think from now on it doesn't matter. I don't think people really care. <laughs> but, but Krugman does two columns. We find the one that we think has more economic meat in it. It was tricky this week because he had another column on health reform. I mean, does he talk about anything else? And we thought, doggone it, we've put people through quite enough of that. On the episodes page or the podcast page at ContraKrugman.com, you can find several episodes in which we've talked about health care. So if, if that's something that's on your mind, we've already covered that. Today, instead, we're looking at a column that, although it does have an economic angle at it, uh, uh, in it, and we're certainly going to take that apart – on the other hand, it really is – really on, it's on moral grounds that Krugman is really making his argument. And the column is called, Is Vast Inequality Necessary? It's the January 15th, 2016 column. It will be linked, as always, at ContraKrugman.com slash 19. And he begins with this question. How rich do we need the rich to be? Now, of course, right away, the way he frames it is – loaded with moral implications. How rich do we need the, do we need the rich to be? 
In other words, it's right right off the bat. It's we have to give our consent to the amount of wealth that people acquire. And of course, assuming they acquire it peacefully, it's not really sure why this would be any of my business. But he says, this is not an idle question. This really is what U.S. politics is basically about, because you have liberals who want to raise taxes on high incomes and use that to boost the, the welfare state. And consumer and uh, conservatives want to do the opposite, because they say when you tax the rich, well, they're not going to have as much incentive to create wealth, and there won't be as many jobs created, and the economy will be hurt. So he says that we've seen that in recent years that the conservative position on this question has really suffered in the face of the evidence because we've got substantially higher tax rates under President Obama. And with Obamacare, we've had the most substantial expansion of the welfare state since the Great Society programs of the 1960s. And you had conservatives saying this would be a disaster. But instead, the president has presided over the best job growth since the 1990s. So I get, it's you know, Bob, it's almost like he's not listening to Contra Krugman. <laughs> I I doubt that, Tom. <laughs> I mean, that he would. It's either that or he's just trolling us by making that claim about job growth under Obama again and again. So I'm going to jot that down. We'll have to hit that one. It has something to do with the business cycle, but but we'll get back to that. Is there a longer term case though in favor of vast inequality? He says, now, many members, he doesn't name any, of the economic elite believe that there is. It won't surprise you to learn that I disagree. I believe that the economy can flourish with much less concentration of income and wealth at the very top. Uh, see, I, I, I want to comment uh, all the time, and I, I'm just the guy summarizing the column, so let me jot this down. Much less. So he's going to have, I'm sure, a non-arbitrary way of determining how much less income inequality there should be. I, I'll look forward to seeing what that criterion is. Okay, I find it helpful to think in terms of three stylized models of where extreme inequality might come from, with the real economy involving elements from all three. So he says, first, it could be because we have individuals who vary in their productivity. If some people are more productive than others, then they're going to earn more than others. So I won't go into his elaboration of that point. Secondly, we could have inequality based largely on luck. So some people just hit the jackpot or they, they have talents that other people don't have that happen to be very marketable. Third, we could have huge inequality based on power. So executives at large corporations who get to set their own compensation, uh, people who profit on inside information, etc. Now, the real economy, says, contains elements of all of these. Uh, certainly, some people are a lot more productive than the average person. But on the other hand, there's also a strong element of luck involved, or even the luck of being born to the right parents. Okay, again, I'm trying not to comment, but how does Krugman want to undo the luck of being born to the right parents. I wonder about that because John Rawls, who was a you know was a big proponent of e of equality, really ha weaselled out of that one when it was presented to him that wouldn't you have to abolish the family to have perfect equality because some parents are going to be more engaged with their children than others and so on and so forth. And he said, well, I don't think that would be necessary. Well, uh, <laughs> oh wow. There's a stunning reply, so okay, we'll talk about that too. And power is surely a big factor too. Uh, he says that although some executives, because the top 0.1% consists mainly of business executive executives, some of these people may have made their fortunes by being associated with risky startups, but most probably got where they are by climbing well-established corporate ladders, and you know, so why should we reward that? So the real question, he says, though, is whether we can redistribute some of the income currently going to the elite few to other purposes without crippling economic progress. So again, it's a purely utilitarian argument. And he says, don't – he." now I think he is listening to Contra Krugman. He says, don't say that redistribution is inherently wrong. All right, Bob, so you got that? Jot that down. Don't say that. We're going to try to run the episode without that. Unfortunately, my parents raised me to believe that it is, but I guess that's just dumb luck. Yeah, I guess we're just going to have to, you know, we might be naughty later, though, you know, and, and mention this anyway, but we're not supposed to, according to this column. He says, even if high incomes perfectly reflected productivity, market outcomes aren't the same as moral justification. All right, so again, I will look for his non-arbitrary moral rule 
that will determine what everybody should get. So I'm sure that'll be toward the end of the column. Uh, And then he says, let's see, since wealth often reflects either luck or power, well, there's a strong case to be made, and this again is right out of Rawls, for collecting some of that wealth in taxes and using it to make society as a whole stronger, as long as it doesn't destroy the incentive to keep creating more wealth. Well, that is the Rawls difference principle right there, which, uh, okay, well, I'll just write this down. (laughs) Sorry, I can't, can't stick to the impartial summarizer role here. All right, and he says, look, America did very well when it had much higher t- top tax rates and lower inequality in the 1950s and 1960s. High tax, low inequality countries like Sweden are doing very well, and so on. So the rich don't have to be as rich as they are. Uh, inequality is inevitable. The vast inequality of America today isn't. Oh, my gosh, Bob. All right, we have to do like a five-part series on this thing. I, I don't know. So you're, right. you're like a CNN anchor. You're just trying to read the news without commenting. It's pretty funny. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So, you know, I'm, I'm out of breath at this point. You have to take over the show. All right, sure. I like the way you, you're right. I had missed the fact that he just, the way he just opens up the column by saying, how rich do we need the rich to be? I mean, just framing it like that. In different contexts, that would be creepy. Well, I mean, it's creepy in this context, too, but not if you're a progressive. <laughs> know. You know, like imagine someone saying, like, how many books do we need the literate to read? Yeah. You know, I mean. <laughs> As if that's the relevant question. Yeah. Or, or you know, how, how many services should the religious, do we need them to attend? You know, things. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to think about that. Yeah, this is an interesting way to think about society from now on, Bob, is how much of this do we need? <laughs> That's good. Right. I mean, it's not even that he's framing it as how much can we take for these really important things without violating rights or, you know, without killing the goose that lays the gold. But he's going the other, he's framing it the other way. Like, you prove to me how much, you know, do we need to tolerate you rich people running around with so much stuff, you know? Yeah. It's like yeah. the burden it's, of proof is on them. Yeah. And of course, I... Oh, God, I'd love to raise this point with people like Krugman or Bernie Sanders. Uh, some, maybe some listeners saw the YouTube video I made. It was a small little video, but it got like 35,000 views very quickly. It was the question Bernie Sanders fans won't answer or can't answer. And it was, you complain about the top 1%, and you say, their lifestyle just seems unimaginable to you. But now think of the rest of mankind looking at your lifestyle. That lifestyle seems unimaginable to them. So in the same way that you're sitting around asking, well, how much money do we need the 1% to have? Couldn't the rest of the world equally well ask, how much money do we need the American middle class to have? Maybe we should have some of that because they have vastly more than we do. And you know what? All of a sudden, all these Bernie supporters say, oh, no, that's totally different. It's totally different, man. It's a different thing. Yeah. Yeah, you know what's different about it? This would involve taking money from you, and that makes it different. But when it's taking money from people you don't like, suddenly, you know, well, that's, that's certainly acceptable. There's never any answer to that question. What, why should there be – why should there not be international redistribution if the principle is that some people just shouldn't have that much more stuff than everybody else? Then, then the, the American middle class should start taking 95 percent of their incomes, writing a check, and sending it to Zimbabwe. Well, yeah, there is that too. And also, I'd like to point out in the climate change debate too, that not to take this too far afield, but all of these measures to you know reduce current greenhouse gas emissions that will lower our conventional GDP, blah, 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 for the benefit of future generations who, under any scenario, are going to be fantastically wealthier than we are. So I really think that we should go ahead and pump CO2 in the atmosphere to redistribute wealth from those future rich people to us right now. That is an excellent point. All right, so many things to say. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to toss it back over to you. What else do you want to say? We, this is totally unrehearsed. Let's just see where it goes. <laughs> I think that the audience realized that when you were jotting notes down as you were summarizing the <laughs> yeah, column. That's right. Some you of know, us read the column I, before the show, but we just like to mix it up. <laughs> I did read the – I didn't realize at the time how much I'd want to comment on. But, but on the other hand, I could have been taking notes just for realism for yes, the show. Yes, yes, yeah. All right. All right. So go all ahead right. and tell we, us. Something. Obviously, folks, Tom and I have all sorts of substantive things to get into. I mean this is, a very, this is just one of the preeminent issues that come up again and again in terms of economics and government policy and so forth. But let me just note as a glancing blow, and we'll put the links up, of course, at the show notes page – that Krugman has uh, gone through a, an evolution, if you will. His views have matured, 
it was as recently as January 2013 where he had a column and he was pushing back. Joe Stiglitz had come out saying how inequality was hindering economic growth. And I was, I must confess, I was very impressed uh, with Krugman at the time because he came out in the New York Times and said, uh, you know, I just, I just don't see how this works. You know, I, you can, you can say that the rich save a higher fraction of their income, but as Milton Friedman taught us, it's the life cycle hypothesis, the permanent income hypothesis that, you know, if, if someone's income fluctuates over time, then yes, in any given year as a snapshot, you will see people with higher incomes will tend to save a higher fraction, but that's because they're going to other things equal be having a really good year that year in terms of they'll be earning above their lifetime average and over their life cycle, their lifetime, we don't see that much evidence that, you know, the rich save a much higher fraction than the middle class or, or working class. So that's, um, so the point is as of January, 2013, Krugman was saying, you know, I'd love to, for political reasons, be able to say, yes, I think inequality hinders economic growth, but I just don't see the mechanism. And and so, you know, where there's a will, there's a way over time, he has figured out how that is possible. So we'll put the links up to show his evolution over time. See, Bob, I'm telling you, this is why you, I've come to decide you really are an indispensable ingredient here at Contra <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, yeah, let's. I, I want to say something about that, by the way, because of the 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 life cycle thing. I've got some stuff here. Uh, this is uh, this is this is right out of Thomas Sowell, who's one of my favorite writers, sort of Austrian sympathizer, though not an Austrian himself. He's got a great new book called Wealth, Poverty, and Politics: An International Perspective. I'll try and remember contrakrugman.com slash nineteen link to the Sowell book because you, you're really going to enjoy this book. But he says that let, – let's follow people around. He, he gives an example of a study at the University of Michigan. Let's follow s- specific individuals. Like I don't care about bottom 20 percent, second to bottom 20 percent. I don't ca- – th- those aren't actual human beings. Those are numbers. That's a statistic. Let's follow a person through his life. And he says that the particular individuals who were initially – in the bottom 20% in income, had their incomes rise over the years, not only at a higher rate, but in a several times larger total amount than the real incomes of those particular individuals whose incomes were initially in the top 20%. And he says, 95% of those people who were initially in the bottom quintile were no longer there 16 years later. 29% had risen all the way from the bottom, all the way to the top, while just 5% remained behind in the bottom quintile where they began. Very interesting. Then secondly, when we think about people in the top 10%, well, the top 10%, well, my goodness, that's a real elite group of people. But you know what? 56% of Americans at one time or another in their lives are in the top 10%. 56% are in there. So some elite group, it consists of more than half the country at one time or another. So it is it kind of important to consider that when you're 25, chances are you're not going to have as much wealth as you will when you're 55. So this, it doesn't just tell the whole story to look at a snapshot. You have to look, in effect, at a video. Well, yeah, that's a, a good point. And uh, let me just give an exaggerated example to make sure people are getting that, because a lot of times when you see these statistics about you know, I, I'm making these numbers up, but it'll say something like, oh, from 1980 to 1989, uh, 62% of the income gains went to the top 18% of the income earners. So again, I'm, I'm just making that number up, but that's the, the way they'll phrase that. And uh, as Sol was pointing out there, that's a very misleading statistic, or at least that by itself doesn't really tell you what the people saying it want you to believe they want you to think it's the same people who are just stuck there. And it's the the top, the people who were rich in 1980 are the people who were rich in 1989 and that their incomes went up by the same amount. But in general, that's not necessarily the case. And as Tom is uh, telling us, when you go and break down the statistics, you see there is a lot of mobility, um, both upwards and downwards. So that the people who were in the top 1% in one year, if you check 10 years later, I mean, they're probably not going to be living on the street, but point is they might not be in the top 1% Oh yeah, in fact, let, 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 me, let me jump in on that because Krugman referred to the charmed, the charmed circle of the 1%. Well, as Sowell says, they, that must, the 1% must, must have some, a somewhat fleeting charm because he did a study and he found out that most of the people in that circle starting in 1996 weren't even there anymore nine years later. So it, do, it, it validates your instinct, which is pretty sound. 
Well, let's see. Uh, what else can we talk about here? Let me also mention again before we get into like the the sort of philosophical issues here. Krugman early on says liberals want to raise taxes on high incomes and use the proceeds to strengthen the social safety net. Now, he really should amend that and say some liberals, because uh, in general, it's it's actually not true that a lot of people who are in favor of these high taxes are just doing it for pragmatic reasons, meaning, oh, well, we need revenue to spend on all these really important social programs. And gosh darn it, we would love to let the rich keep all of their income, but you know that we think they've earned through just pure luck and, and corporate greed and backstabbing and so on that serves no social purpose. But unfortunately, we need to get that money from somewhere. Th- that's actually not the case, and that's why I, I have to uh, applaud him, Thomas Piketty, you know, the, our, our good friend Tom from France. Uh, some of the uh, we'll put a link up here on the show notes page. But when I was going through his book, I just started jotting down some of these passages were breathtaking. Let me just read. Uh, Let's see. Let me just read two of these. So this comes from page 585 of his uh, his best-selling book. When a government taxes a certain level of income or inheritance at a rate of 70 or 80 percent, the primary goal is obviously not to raise additional revenue, and then in parentheses, because these very high brackets never yield much. It is rather to put an end to such incomes in large estates, which lawmakers have for one reason or another come to regard as socially unacceptable and economically unproductive. And then uh, later on page 518, Piketty says, the primary purpose of the capital tax is not to finance the social state, but to regulate capitalism. The goal is first to stop the indefinite increase in inequality of wealth and second to impose effective regulation on the financial and banking system in order to avoid crises. All right. So, again, I had to respect his honesty because you certainly get the sense, you know, when, when you're reading Krugman's column, even it doesn't seem like. He's really torn. He said, geez, I really wish we could just let these people keep all their income, but we can't because we got to build bridges. You know, you get the sense that he doesn't think they deserve it anyway, so let's go ahead and take it from them. And don't worry, that won't hurt us in any way. That, there won't be any fallout from that. And so I do appreciate that Piketty at least was admitting the point of these tax rates that I'm recommending is not primarily to raise revenue because they won't. The point is to just make sure there's not a bunch of rich people walking around. Yeah, yeah, that really is what it is. And I have nothing against rich people. Now, now, by the way, by the way, let's insert the caveat that we're going to get 8,000 emails if we don't insert. Obviously, people who got their wealth disreputably or in ways that are incompatible with libertarianism are not the people we're defending here. Secondly, yes, I do know that uh, the Federal Reserve and what it does can uh, aggravate income inequality artificially. I know that too. But I don't believe that those two explanations are the full account fully for all the wealthy people. There are wealthy people who are completely honest and came about their wealth honestly, and those people should be defended because I I don't believe there is any moral justification for for looting them, and there is no non-arbitrary standard by which you can decide how much they should be looted. So better just not to start. Right, and of course, just to follow up on that, to the extent that it is true that there are plenty of people in the world today who have very high standards of living relative to their peer or their neighbors because of ill-gotten gains through, you know, cronyism and so forth. The solution is not to have a punitive high marginal tax rate. The solution is to take away the federal reserve and the right, uh, you know, limits on competition and so forth. Now, also we should bear in mind that when people say, people even like Bernie Sanders say we need punishingly high, well, he wouldn't use the word punishingly, although maybe he would gleefully, marginal tax rates, and that'll stick it to the rich. Think about it, though. That doesn't really stick it to the rich because it doesn't touch their existing wealth. It touches only their current income. So if I am sitting on a billion dollars and now I'm taking it easy and I'm only earning you know, a million a year, it's only the million a year that Bernie's taxes would touch. My billion is still sitting there in the bank. So there's no, there's no connection between income tax rates and wealth. All you're doing by imposing these rates is trying to frustrate people who don't already have a lot of wealth and who are trying to accumulate some. So yeah, it's no surprise. It's so funny, you know, these these uh, naive liberals to hear them say, isn't it wonderful that these socially conscious billionaires favor high income tax rates? Yeah, it lessens the competition. It makes it harder for people to to rise up into those ranks. It doesn't touch them very much because they've got this huge pile of dough they've already earned that's not touched by those taxes. 
Yeah, it's funny you bring that up, Tom. I have heard now I folks, I'm not endorsing this theory. I I can't confirm it, but I have heard people advance the theory saying if you go back and look, you know, when when the federal income tax came in that, you know, some of the the real large families or whatever behind the scenes were okay with that because they knew that that was the way to ensure that, you know, their family who would be, had become billionaires that they would be on top. Right. That what's the best way to ensure that your grandson's going to take over the family business eventually and still be dominant is to have uh, punitively high rates on those who are just up and coming. Right. So they can never accumulate wealth, as Tom is saying, because they get they get taxed at such high rates and you have all sorts of vehicles by which you can, you know, put your money in trust and so forth and avoid uh, taxation that way. So, and so you can pass it down to your to your uh, heirs and, and avoid all of the taxes that hit the little people. I've got a whole bunch more stuff. I get some juicy statistics. I got a lot more stuff. But we're going to pause for a minute to hear the story of Bad Luck Ichabod. Hey, everybody, it's story time now. It's time for the story of Bad Luck Ichabod. Ah, poor Bad Luck Ichabod. He tried to master the freedom philosophy entirely on his own. Oh, he had a stack of books, 200 of them. He was going to read on U.S. history and free market economics and libertarianism, and he was going to master it. And you know what happened. He read a book and a half, he gave up on life, and then he became a Bernie Sanders supporter, so he wouldn't have to do all this thinking. Now, you don't want that to happen to you. You want to be like Good Luck Fred. Good Luck Fred discovered LibertyClassroom.com, where he could learn the history and economics we didn't get in school in courses he can listen to on the go, taught by guests and the host of The Tom Woods Show. In addition to 15 courses you can listen to on the go, we have discussion forums and live question sessions and recommended readings and everything you need to become the master of this material. Plus, save some dough on our coupons page at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. Check it out. Don't be bad luck, Ichabod. Check out libertyclassroom.com. Folks, if you would like insight into financial markets, economics, and your own cash flow situation, insight that you won't get anywhere else, then check out the Lara Murphy Report, published by Bob Murphy, co-host of Contra Krugman, and his colleague Carlos Lara. Carlos Lara has decades of experience in consulting with business owners in financial distress. And of course, Bob Murphy is an economist who has experience in academia, policy analysis, and the financial sector. With their two strengths combined, the resulting Lara Murphy Report is a must-read monthly publication. Every issue, you'll read an interview with an academic or a financial professional who uses Austrian economics on the job. Recent and upcoming issues feature Bob's analysis of the minimum wage debate and inclusion of the Chinese currency as a reserve currency for the IMF. Check out three free issues at ContraKrugman.com slash LMR. All right, let's talk a little bit about luck, given that we just heard about bad luck Ichabod and good luck Fred. That's why the only Ichabod I'd ever heard of before bad luck Ichabod was Ichabod Crane. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But this, this reflects the fact that I live in Topeka, Kansas. It's the team name of Washburn University. They're the Ichabods, which I think means something like faithless, like the faithless one. So yeah, we're the faithless ones. Come root for our team. It's just there's something a little bit odd about it. So I just thought, yeah. That one's beautiful. I'm using bad luck Ichabod. All right. Talk about <laughs> luck here. Does luck mean if, if I'm – now, there are all kinds of luck. It could, there could be luck whereby I have some inside information that nobody else has, which seems to be a form of luck that Krugman has in mind. But there's also – there are other kinds of luck that maybe I'm just in the right place at the right time or I just happen upon – not through any particular insight, just through sheer luck. I just, you know, I, I spun the wheel and chose some particular product and it did really well. Or I have some talent that is highly marketable. Let's say I'm a really, really good golfer and you're a really, really good chess player. Now, that's totally realistic, Bob, because you're a terrible golfer and chess player. But <laughs> l let's just imagine that. If, if that were the case, the chess player you know, kind of gets screwed because there's not much of a market for watching people play chess. But there is a market of people watching play golf, and it's not your fault that you were born with that talent. Okay, so 
these are the types that now sh- sh- doesn't that mean that therefore the state is justified in saying look you didn't earn that talent you didn't deserve that and even if you come back and say but but i worked hard and i practiced to cultivate my talent okay so now you you also have a good work ethic you don't deserve that either we can take the fruits of your labor is there anything wrong with that that you can see well sure but first i want to just address the injustice i'm a <laughs> mediocre chess player and a terrible golfer all right folks let's not let's not overstate the case here this is getting more and more like a Michael Malice episode all the time, actually, which I, I like. So, <laughs> all right, go ahead. Now that you've recovered from that terrible blow, go ahead. Wait, so I should start defending statists? Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and this here, I mean, there, there's different levels of, of what do people mean when they say, oh, the reason so-and-so is, is wealthy because of luck. And let me just relate something. Uh, for those uh, familiar with the Malcolm Gladwell, he's got a lot of best-selling books. I think he's a, a very good writer. The thing with his books, though, is – I love the, the the research he does. He tells a great story, but typically the theme or the conclusion he draws, the, the lessons, I think, are totally wrong. And so he's got this book called Outliers, and um, he I think he, he goes through and, and follows like to explain how did Bill Gates be, get to be so wealthy or how did the Beatles become so successful. And he, his takeaway is that it was largely just happenstance. You know, they were in the right place at the right time or whatever. But it's not that, oh, Bill Gates was born with genes that predisposed him to knowing how computers work. It was that because of his personal situation, Bill Gates ended up spending 10,000 hours in a computer lab in college. And so that's how he got to the level of expertise. And the story he tells with the Beatles is just the, the, their grueling schedule and the way they were making money when they were first starting out is they just happened to play together in all these you know dive bars and whatever in these concert halls for 10,000 hours until they achieved this magical level of expertise. So whether or not those stories are true, and I've seen people challenge his Beatles story, the point is he was saying they were lucky in that their circumstances allowed them to really work harder at this than anybody else. And so I want to say, how is that indistinguishable from the story that said the reason they got on top was through hard work? Okay, I like that. I, I think that's a. I think that's pretty strong. But what do you say about uh, what about the golfer? I, I mean, business instincts is one thing, but the golfer, you know, it's it, it's just by luck that he lives in a society where golf services are considered valuable by a lot of people. That's pure luck that he has a skill that people care about, right? Well, well right. So, yeah, and, and there, too, we should break it down. I mean, uh, I think, uh, like, let's take Michael Jordan. Yes, he had a certain natural aptitude. You know, somebody who was born and is only ends up being four foot five or something is, is probably not going to be a star NBA player. That's just probably not going to happen. It's physically impossible. But Michael Jordan is like the most competitive person you've ever seen. You know, when you see him hitting some of those game winning shots and how nuts he goes and whatever. So, I mean, he is a really hard worker. Same thing with Larry Bird and whatever, you know, his legendary that he was practicing, whatever, when the other guys were screwing around on road trips and things. So the people who reach the pinnacle of success, yes, they have a natural attitude, but they also the reason they are the champions is they have more of a drive and they practice harder than anybody else because there's lots of people who are born with natural aptitude. So it's it's odd that we're pushing it back to, and I'm, I know you were saying this, Tom, but I just want to, to make sure people realize that, that really the, the luckiness is that the, yeah, the thing that you push yourself to achieve and be excellent in happens to be something that's highly compensated. That you know, So yeah, the, the person who is the best basketball player in the world is going to make more money than the person who is the best Dungeons & Dragons player in the world. That's that's true, at least for for the foreseeable future. And is that unfair or is that lucky? I mean, I don't know how we're supposed to to address that. I mean, it's people like what they like, and it, it just it, at some level, I mean, you could say, well, yeah, this guy over here discovered a cure for cancer, and this guy over here figured out how to make a, you know a better uh, breakfast sandwich, and why why should we care more about the cancer discovery? I mean, it's, it's people care about certain things and it, it's it seems odd that we're gonna you know how, at, at what level do we stop pushing it back and just admit that somebody has contributed more than somebody else and that that's why we like the contribution more on the other hand krugman is trying to say that these people in the top let's say one tenth of one percent are not people whose contributions we should really value they're not really contributions they're just drones who climbed the corporate ladder well, right. So again, he he is breaking it up. So we're we're trying to deal with, you know, just just there we wrapped up discussing what if somebody legitimately is contributing things that the rest of us really do value, 
And it's just the reason he did is because of luck. And when we tried to unpack that and to say, well, at some level, you know, no matter what the person does, I mean, you know, Einstein, just lucky that he had a mind that could do that stuff. And that it's a good thing he was sitting in the patent office and could just, you know, while away the time thinking about what would happen as you got closer to the speed of light and turn on your headlights or whatever. And, we're, you know, the, the various thought experiments he went through. What, what if Einstein had been working out in the fields or something, had been a slave? He wouldn't have been able to come up with relativity. And that's true. But again, that, that doesn't make his contribution any less significant. So now if we're switching the argument and saying these people who happen to be highly compensated in the current existing economy, but really they're not contributing a lot, what, what do we say about that? Well, one thing is it's policies that Krugman favors and not ones that Tom and I favor that allow this to persist. If it really is the case... I mean, just think about that. So you've got these large corporations, and it's self-evident to everybody, including Krugman and all his readers, that these corporate executives really aren't contributing a lot, and yet they're just giving themselves million-dollar bonuses and stuff, right? He says right here, executives at large corporations who get to set their own compensation. That's the phrase he uses. So it's weird that the shareholders are fine with that. Are, are Are the owners of the company the only ones who don't know how much they're getting ripped off, that Krugman knows more about their money than they do? And so part of the explanation there, to the extent that it's true, is that you have rules against, for example, so-called hostile takeovers. And think, so because you think about what happens in a so-called hostile takeover is somebody realizes the book value of the company is higher than what the current profitability indicates. And so they come in and they buy up, they offer more to the existing shareholders than the current market price. So the shareholders are happy to sell. And then they come in and they start cutting management. They start firing people because they realize the company is being run in a slipshod manner. And I don't think Krugman and his friends are real big fans of hostile takeovers and layoffs. I think they would be horrified by that. And they're all, they're happy to have laws regulating that. And you got to announce it and so on before right. you try to do so. Again, the, the the sorts of things they're stating is just obvious features of modern laissez-faire capitalism. When you just think about it for two minutes, it's not clear how could that persist in a genuinely free market. All right, I'm going to shift gears a bit here. I want to make sure I get all these statistics in before we get out of here. I want to make sure I've 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 covered them all because I I gathered them up and I think they're useful just as a way of thinking about inequality to to get it a little bit less cartoonish in people's minds. So, for instance. Most of the households in the bottom 20% of income earners have nobody working in them. So when you look at the top 5%, you have more heads of households working full-time and year-round in the top 5% than in the bottom 20%. So right off the bat, there's an obvious difference here. Uh, Then we have, in the, the U.S., we have demographic factors. So it turns out that Japanese Americans, just to take one example, are more than 20 years older on average than Puerto Ricans in the United States. Well, that means that Japanese Americans are guaranteed to be wealthier because older people are generally wealthier than younger for obvious reasons. Let's see. Another one is I mentioned uh, earlier the, the age thing with the different brackets. It turns out that if you're looking at American households headed by someone at, le- at least uh, – headed by somebody 25 years old, 25 years old, 13% of those households have been in the top 20% of household incomes. But then you look at households headed by somebody 60 years old, and 73% of those households are in the top 20%. So you look at the top 20%, it's generally people who are older. And so when you look at people who are 60, almost three out of four of them are in the top uh, quintile, which is a, an amazing s- statistics, or at least have been in that top quintile. They have been in there, whereas the, the 25-year-old, only 13% have been in there. Now, as Sowell puts it, you know, since every 60-year-old was one, at one time a 25-year-old, increased income differences between age brackets are not exactly an injustice to Americans who live out a normal lifespan. But then also, look, there's the basic fact that everybody, everybody is vastly wealthier than they were. Uh, well, you know, they, people like to talk about the 1950s. Anybody want to go back to the 1950s? Because you can anytime you want to. Anytime you want to. You could, you could have a, a single earner household, and you could have a standard of living like what Ralph Cramden had on the Honeymooners. You could have a two-room apartment with no refrigerator, no TV, and no telephone. You could easily do that. And it would be the 1950s, which is the great, glorious time in American history that Paul Krugman likes to point to. You could have that back anytime you want. Nobody wants that, obviously. So 
what they want are higher standards of living. And that's exactly what we've had over the past two centuries under the engine of capitalism. And, you know, I talked to Deirdre McCloskey about this, and she said that, you know, going up to the early 19th century, you look around the world, the average income was $3 a day. $3 a day. Now the average income is about, and this is even including the poorest countries who are going to drag the, the numbers way, way down, it's now $33 a day, an, a, an increase of 11 times. This is an amazing improvement. I mean, it's nothing like this has ever been seen before. And we sit around tapping our feet saying, well, how come things aren't moving faster? They've never moved anywhere like this speed in this direction at any time ever in history. And, and one other thing, Bob, before I uh, move things on, I'm going to link at uh, ContraKrugman.com slash 19 to a column that has a lot of uh, really good charts in it. And one of them has to do with how much money do people in the lowest 10%, so the bottom 10% of income earners, how much do they earn in the various countries of the world? And if you can, obviously, it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's, it's not super precise when we do these economic freedom of the world studies, but it's, you know, it's a ballpark idea. So if we divide the world into the least free countries, the third to least, the second to least, and the most free countries, in the least free countries, the bottom 10% are earning $932 a year. This is in 2001 dollars. But in the most free countries, the bottom 10% are earning $10,556 per year. That's the thing that matters. So wait, 10000 is more than 900 right? It, it is, as a matter of fact. It, it's, it is slightly more than 900 So to my, my, my view is, obviously, I'm nowhere. I'm not in the top 1%. But what possible concern is that of mine? They didn't take that money from me. They didn't take part of my speaking fees or, you know, my Amazon affiliate income or whatever. They didn't take any of that from me. That is, has nothing to do with me. That is entirely envy. Now, if it, again, if it's people who have committed injustice, then that's great. I'm glad that you're upset about injustice. We all should be. But generally, it's not injustice. It's pure envy. It has nothing to do with you how much other people are earning. So anyway, so the whole thing I find absolutely morally despicable that anybody thinks about this for even one second. Well, yeah, let me just follow up on two of those issues. So you, you, Krugman does mention the 50s and 60s. Now, I want to confess, Tom, that it, I personally am not fully sure that I understand. I mean, we know there's problems with the, the official GDP statistics that the BEA points out. And we could, you know, some future episode, maybe we'll go through the whole thing about that, all the problems with the official GDP statistics, not least of which is, you know, wartime spending all of a sudden boosts output apparently on paper. But this this idea that the 50s and 60s, I mean, progressives love to point to those two decades because the, of the high marginal income tax rates. So let me just make one little caveat there, make sure people realize that it's a little bit misleading. So what people are, what they have in mind is it is true that through the 50s and early 60s, the top personal income tax rate was 91 or 92 percent, depending on what year you look at. So you hear that and you're like, holy cow, 91 percent. You would think just listening to the Wall Street Journal editorial board or something that clearly they must have been living in the dark ages at that point with such a high rate. But when you go in, and we'll put a link up at the show notes page, it's a it's misleading because the 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 threshold at which that kicked in was quite high. So in 1963, it was 1.5 million dollars was the income you had to earn in 2013 dollars, right? So that's in, that's inflation adjusted. But the idea is, as of 2013, and the reason 2013 is that's the the analysis where I'm I'm drawing on here, and I'll we'll post the link. But when you adjust what the threshold was back in '63 to make it in terms of 2013 dollars, that 91 percent only kicked in when you earned 1.5 million dollars. So to to get a to give a sort of apples to apples, in 2013, if you earned 86 thousand dollars. Your your income tax rate at that level was twenty eight percent, whereas in sixty three it was thirty eight percent. So it was still higher, but the point is it wasn't astronomically higher. That reminds me, I actually did a post on this whole nineteen fifties thing and top marginal tax rate tax rates a couple of years ago. I'll dig that out, and I'll also link to to that at the show notes page. So check out these show notes pages, by the way. They're actually beautiful. Uh, a lot of them, they've got graphs and graphics sometimes. I'm not guaranteeing any this time, but they're, we've got the Krugman column. We've got uh, 
Contra columns against Krugman, a bunch of different resources. So ContraKrugman.com is not to be missed. Also, it's got a funny, you know, it's got the, it's just like the podcast graphic that you see. It's got the funny little caricature stuff. So yeah, w- uh, definitely yeah, worth folks, checking out. When yeah, it what comes else? to uh, pride in one's productivity, Tom is definitely in the top 1%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, that's true. Although I, I do want to give credit to AJ Van Slyke, who does a lot of the uh, the actual uh, elbow grease with regard to the show notes pages. But I I sort of midwife them. If only yeah. I knew what that word meant, I would be more confident <laughs> yeah. that I was. Well, using of course, it it's just it's just lucky that we happen to live in a society where a lot of people really can't stand Paul Krugman. Uh, yeah, it really is. That's a good one. Why didn't I think of that? Well, because it's a good one, and I, I'm I'm not fast enough. I would have thought yes. of that two days I, from uh, now. I, I have the <laughs> try and go back and, and insert it into yes. the episode re up. 87 percent of the jokes on this podcast are captured by the top 50 percent of the hosts <laughs> yeah exactly and, and of course given that i will live to be age 60 by the time i get to be age 60 i will have come up with a lot more jokes <laughs> than i've than i've come All up right. with by let, now. let me hit this one you you alluded to it tom and i'm got this idea krugman's got a line here saying market outcomes aren't the same as moral justification oh yeah how did we not yeah. hit so that? yeah go ahead now what now again what krugman means there is he's saying that, hey, even if I stipulate for the sake of argument that th- these incomes really do reflect marginal productivity uh, properly calculated or estimated, nonetheless, just because somebody's marginal contribution is $600 million last year, there's no moral reason that he therefore deserves the $600 million. So I think Tom probably will be able to, to talk more about that aspect. But what I want to make the point is there's this funny contradiction where – progressives often go around lecturing us and telling us, hey, don't think that these rich people over here are special people. Just because they make a lot of money doesn't mean they're better. And so I don't want them thinking that they're better than, than, you know, the school teacher who just earns $30,000 or $40,000 a year. They shouldn't think that at all. And, And that's true. It, it, your income per se does not reflect your moral worth. It's, it's not a barometer of your goodness. Just to switch analogies, I can, as an economist, explain in terms of marginal output and, and marginal utility and so forth why the market price of a television set is much higher than the market price of a Bible. That doesn't mean that, therefore, I would have to say, well, geez, you know, as a libertarian, it must mean that I think TVs are more important to households than Bible. Of course I wouldn't say that. I would say those are totally separate realms. One thing's talking about morality and ethical importance. The other thing's talking about a market price. And so by the same token, I can certainly explain as an economist why some people earn these high incomes, and that doesn't mean that they're good people necessarily or that that's a, a signal of their moral worth. But Krugman's trying to take that and, and, and flip it to mean, therefore, it's not immoral if we take their property. Yeah, exactly right. In fact, I was going to I was going to do um – I was, I, I was going to do a comparison of a Bible and something else, then I was going to say, if the Bible doesn't resonate with you, think of an Ayn Rand novel. You, you might think that, given the wisdom in it, it ought to cost a million dollars. If if the Krugman you know, caricature of market prices is correct, and that we judge things, we judge incomes as if they are a reflection of moral worth, why shouldn't we judge consumer goods by how expensive they are? And that's a reflection of moral worth. So therefore, Bastiat's The Law, which sells for like a dollar, must be the stupidest book ever written. I mean, this is stupid. This is a ridiculous way to think about things. It has nothing to do with how market prices are formed. There are many factors going into, I mean, yes, it's supply and demand, but there are many factors that constitute the supply and constitute the demand. Why do people value particular types of uh, work more than they value others? Or why is it that there are many, many more people who have the skills necessary to be school teachers than to be professional basketball players? Those are empirical questions, but these factors all go into the supply and demand schedules that ultimately settle on the market price that we see or the income the, the the salaries that we see the, the this is simply the result of people's voluntary decisions to buy and sell that's all it is it's nobody's sitting down forming a committee to render moral judgments on the worth of people it's just the, that that would be miraculous if the random buying and selling decisions of people also happen to reflect deep philosophical moral judgment it has nothing to do with that at all it's, it's a completely different realm uh, of of life um I want to add one other thing to something I said before about people's standard of living rising, because this is—it's apparently—it's been estimated that most people, most Americans, 
living in the early 19th century, lived out their entire lives within a 50-mile radius of where they were born. Now, we, so I mean, on a weekend day, we might drive more than 50 miles from where we were born, much less we might move away and, and whatever. I mean, imagine, that is a completely different lifestyle than we have now, and that, that would be unimaginable to some people. That's something that affects everybody. And by the way, any qual- here, here's, I love that Mises point, and then we should probably wrap up. The Mises point about uh, that I use a lot that actually inequality in the sense that really matters has fallen dramatically over the centuries. If you think about the way, let's take transportation. How did people get around hundreds of years ago? Well, the rich had their coach driven by four horses, and the poor walked around. And maybe they had a pair of shoes if they were, uh, you know, middle class or upper, you know, but that was it. That was how they got around. Today, the rich drive around in their fancy cars, and the poor drive around in their beat-up cars. Well, that's obviously a dramatic decrease in inequality. But then this thing I just said about travel and people living out their whole lives in a 50-mile radius. All right, well, think about what that th- – think about that and now think about today. Now, the rich – the rich, let's say over the course of the 20th century, the rich have always been able to travel anywhere they want. They can, they can go wherever they want. But the poor really couldn't. But now almost everybody can – make long distance trips, you know, maybe not as often as they'd like, but almost everybody can make a long, or what, what somebody in the 19th century would have considered a long distance trip, whereas the rich can still do that, they always could. You know, the rich always could get actors to come to their homes or musicians to come to their homes. Now, a poor person can put headphones on and while he's doing something else, have Mozart's symphony playing for him. So the the inequality has dramatically decreased in the only sense that really matters, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, back in the day, I mean, Carl Menger would have needed to just have you and me go over there during his tutoring sessions and just teach, whereas now everyone could just put on their earphones and listen to us while they're at the gym or something. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely amazing. I mean, the the world is an amazing place thanks to the... the very forces that Paul Krugman wants to destroy, and 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 on that note, well, let me just let me end with a different one, slightly different note. Okay, I do. I have one more point to make here that I want to. You know, we're focusing on on money and you know how much can I buy at the grocery store? Or can I get a super saver flight over to Europe and so forth? In terms of inequality, stuff that actually matters in, in terms of gross injustices, it is clearly areas where the state is in charge, where these horrors occur. All right, so. You know, the, the average person on planet Earth right now, the thing that's going to really be bad is not, oh, man, I don't get to buy as many steaks as somebody living down the street. It's going to be things like there's going to be a war or the police are going to come in the middle of the night and take my dad away and, and I'll never see him again because he spoke out against the government or uh, – you know, my my brother was was selling a plant that he grew to some people who like to smoke, and so people broke down the doors and took him away, and I never see him again. So it's things like that that are really the source of major injustice. And so the idea of whether you make sixty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars in the grand scheme, that is pretty irrelevant compared to the true inequality. The people who are in bed with or running this apparatus of the state versus its victims. And so I think we should keep that in mind. So again, the the kind of society that Tom and I are picturing, or what we would call a free society that uh, lives up to the libertarian ideals of respecting property rights, there a, a rich person really would have no more rights than somebody else. He wouldn't be able to buy verdicts in a court. He wouldn't be able to c- commit crimes with impunity the way that actual rich people in today's society get away with because the state is so corrupt and you can do things behind the scenes with your wealth that you wouldn't be able to get away with in a genuinely free society. Bob, this is entirely subjective judgment here, but I, this is my favorite episode we've done so far. Number 19. It's prime... Right, now I'm getting dorky here, thinking about the significance <laughs> of the number 19. But, <laughs> I, but that the number 19 now is going to have a special place in my heart. I, I like this episode. And whether or not you think we're done, I think we have to be done, and we can always talk about it. It probably won't be the last time Krugman will talk about inequality. Definitely not the last time he's going to talk about health care, but it's the last time we're going to talk about health care for a little while, or at least until Bob's book sales start to lag, and then we'll, then we'll bring it back up again. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. It's... Uh, 
ContraKrugman.com slash 19, where you can get all the resources that we've been mentioning. Please do spread the words the word about Contra Krugman to your friends, because surely you know some anti-Krugman friends, and they're going to love this episode in particular. It's a great way to get them hooked on the show. Uh, any final words, Bob? I keep taking shots at you that are completely unjustified and unprovoked. I'm just going to turn the other cheek, and uh, I'm going to work on my chess game. Yeah, all right. <laughs> very good. I was going to say, Contra Krugman has taken a very disturbing turn as of episode number 19. <laughs> all right. Anyway, thanks very much, everybody. See you next week. Thanks for listening to Contra Krugman. Subscribe to the show for free on iTunes or Stitcher at ContraKrugman.com. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, our blog, books by Tom and Bob, and more at ContraKrugman.com. See you next week.